It's dark outside, almost 2 a.m. You go outside and look at the sky, and here it is, bright, full moon. You might think you know a lot about Earth's natural satellite, but let me ask you this, how did it form? The answer is, nobody knows. But of course, there are theories. The most popular one, called the Giant Impact Theory, claims that the moon formed during a collision between Earth and another planet. This planet must have been smaller than ours, the size of Mars, and the collision itself probably happened around 4.5 billion years ago. Another theory, called the Capture Theory, claims that the moon used to be an asteroid or some other wandering body. It formed somewhere else in the solar system. When it was passing by Earth, it got caught by our planet's gravity. But here is one catch. Our planet and the moon have remarkable isotopic and chemical similarities. So, they must have a linked history, which means the moon couldn't have been created elsewhere. Other experts think that at some point in the past, Earth was spinning so fast that some of its material broke away. It soon started to orbit our planet. That's how the moon appeared in the sky. But again, there's one problem. In this case, the proportion and type of minerals on the moon would have to be the same as on Earth. But there are slight differences. The moon is richer in materials that form very fast at high temperatures. There's one more theory, and it's probably the least exciting. It claims that Earth's natural satellite could simply appear along with Earth during our planet's formation. Duh! But these days, a more urgent question keeps astronomers busy. Is the moon really Earth's satellite? Or are these two twin planets? The moon is big compared to our planet, about one quarter of Earth's size. That's why some experts refer to our planetary system as a double planet. But how correct is that? If we want to figure it out, we need to give the definition to the word planet. According to the International Astronomical Union, a planet is a space body that orbits the sun, is massive enough to have a nearly round shape thanks to its gravity, and has cleared the region around its orbit. Now, what about a satellite? It's an object in space that orbits around a larger celestial body. If we take the system Earth, the Moon, its center of gravity, called a barycenter, is inside the Earth. That's why at the moment we can't say that we live in a twin planet system. According to this definition, the Moon is the satellite of our planet. Now, let's get back to the past, like 3 or 4 billion years ago. Even though the Moon wasn't a planet, it most likely had a full-fledged atmosphere. It formed at times when powerful volcanic eruptions were rocking our satellite. Gases spread all over the Moon's surface, and it happened so fast that they didn't have enough time to escape into space. At that time, the lunar surface was covered with basins filled with volcanic basalt. Just imagine ginormous plumes of magma hurtling high into the air, falling to the ground and creating lava flows. That's how the basalt basins appeared on the surface of the Moon. At one point, scientists got their hands on samples brought from the Moon. They found out that lava flows there contained not only carbon monoxide and sulfur, but also the building blocks of water. Thanks to these samples, researchers managed to calculate the amount of gas that rose and formed the atmosphere. It became the thickest around 3.5 billion years ago and existed for about 70 million years. After that, poof, the atmosphere was lost in space. But the coolest thing? When the Moon did have an atmosphere, the satellite was 3 to 10 times closer to our planet. One computer simulation even suggests the Moon was probably up to 19 times closer than it is now. The distance between it and our planet could be 18,600 miles, while these days our satellite is around 240,000 miles away. That's why the Moon looked much, much bigger in the sky. Unfortunately, at that time, not even dinos were around to admire the view. These days, the atmosphere of the Moon is almost non-existent, and that's why the satellite can't protect itself from meteorites. The surface of the Moon is dotted with craters. For comparison, there are about 190 identified impact craters on our planet. Many of them are hidden by vegetation or covered with water. But if we speak about the Moon, 
the number is so much greater, several million, and around 5,000 of them are more than 12 miles across. And since the moon is less seismically active than Earth, these craters and other ancient formations stay in perfect condition for centuries. When you look at the moon, it's the brightest object in the night sky. But in reality, its surface is dark because the reflectance of our natural satellite is just a bit higher than that of asphalt. The space crew had been getting ready for the launch for over three years. The preparations for landing on the strange planet included gathering and studying rock samples in the Grand Canyon, exploring ancient volcano formations in the Nevada National Security Site, and looking into gas and lava vents, lava lakes, and pit craters in various locations in Hawaii. To be able to resist microgravity conditions, they learned how to walk obliquely by being strapped and suspended sideways and trying to move along walls. They had to test their limits through intensive diet and sleep regimens to make sure they'd be safe in outer space. It took them three days, three hours, and 49 minutes to reach the surface of this new world in a place called the Sea of Tranquility. They could have gone for the Ocean of Storms or the Central Bay, but they chose this place to land because it had good visibility and it was relatively smooth and easily reachable with as little propellant as possible. One of the first things they noticed when they got there was that, well, the place kind of smelled. This may sound like the beginning of a science fiction novel, but it's actually the true story about how the Apollo 11 mission landed on the moon on July 20th, 1969. Since then, the moon has had 12 human visitors to this day. We think of it as our neighboring space buddy, but there's still much we don't know about this mysterious satellite. And that should come as no surprise, since the moon is actually always showing us the same face. That is because the Earth and its only permanent natural satellite are in synchronous rotation, which makes us think it's always permanently still. The truth is, it's not in a fixed position, and it is actually moving further and further away from the Earth each year by 1.5 inches. Believe it or not, the Earth and the Moon, although being 238,855 miles apart, deeply influence each other. While the Moon is partially responsible for the tides of the seas and oceans on our planet's surface, our Earth is actually to blame for movement on the Moon. They're called moonquakes, and they last way longer than earthquakes, some of them up to half an hour. It may look perfectly round to us on a warm summer's night, but the Moon is actually oval. The lemon-like shape is caused by the Earth's gravitational pull. Our moon features more than footprints when it comes to traces of humans. In 1969, American astronauts left many objects on the surface of our satellite, such as two golf balls, a drawing by famous artist Andy Warhol, and a message from Queen Elizabeth II herself. One of the last people to walk on the moon to this day, an astronaut named Eugene Cernan, scribbled his daughter's initials on the moon's surface in 1972. Since it appears there's no wind or any other type of weather change there, the letters TDC could remain there permanently. It's actually possible to be allergic to the moon. Harrison Jack Schmidt, an astronaut from the Apollo 17 mission, spent some time in a valley in the Sea of Serenity, then climbed back into the crew's lunar module, but had some moon dust on him. Just as he removed his spacesuit, he got red eyes, sneezing fits, and other allergic reactions that lasted two hours. Since it's so close to us, we've established that the Moon has a time zone of its own. We call it the Lunar Standard Time, but it doesn't correspond to time on Earth. To get an equivalent, the explanation is a bit more complex, but in simple terms, a year on the Moon is split up into 12 days, each one about as long as a month on Earth. Each one of these days got its name after a different astronaut who has walked on the moon. The start date of this calendar coincides with the moment Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. So, the lunar year one, day one, began on July 21st, 1969 at 2.56.15 Universal Time. Since the moon has a very thin atmosphere, it has some pretty crazy temperatures, both hot and cold. They can go up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Over by the moon's poles, however, the temperature is always at around minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Humans have tried to trace the connection between our natural satellite and the Earth for as long as we can remember. 
coming up with words to explain why the moon's existence influences us so. In the Middle Ages, scientists and philosophers thought that during a full moon, some people were more likely to experience different health conditions. Because they saw this inexplicable connection to the full moon, people with these symptoms were named lunatics, or at times, literally, moonsick. People are not the only creatures living on Earth that are affected by moon cycles. Dog owners are 28% more likely to take their pet to vet emergency rooms during the full moon. You may think that's the reason why wolves have this preference for howling at a full moon, more so in popular culture. But scientists haven't been able to find any connection between wolf behavior and the lunar cycles, so it might as well just be a myth. The largest known crater in our solar system is also found on our moon and is called the South Pole Aitken. This giant formation is located on the far side of the moon and measures 1,550 miles in diameter. One of the many things we've yet to fully understand about our satellite is the unusual flashes of light that can sometimes be seen on its surface. Scientists have named these outbursts transient lunar phenomena, or TLP in short, and they have been seen all over the world for centuries. Have you ever wondered why Earth doesn't have rings? Gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have them. But the rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, don't. Two theories describe how ring systems potentially developed. The first one says that rings may have formed from leftovers that date from the time a certain planet was forming. Or, as the second one says, they could be the remains of a moon that was either destroyed in a collision or broken apart by the gravitational pull of its parent planet. Scientists still don't know why the gas giants have rings, but they think it could be because they formed in the outer solar system. Rocky planets formed in the inner area of our solar system, which is why they were more protected from potential impacts and collisions that might have formed rings around them. Or the reason is that the bigger planets have a larger volume which allows a ring system to remain stable. Some scientists think our planet did have a ring system a long time ago. In its early stage, a Mars-sized object hit the Earth, and this probably resulted in a dense ring of debris. But its ring system pretty soon coalesced, and that's the way our moon was formed. More than 10 years ago, in 2011, Astronomers found a huge water vapor cloud about 12 billion light years away from our planet. This cloud is the oldest source of water that we know of. It dates back to when the universe was only 1.6 billion years old. And now it's 13.8 billion years old. This unusual cloud is also the biggest source of water that we know of. It holds 140 trillion times the amount of water that the Earth contains in all its oceans. <laughs> Enormous. The cool thing is, this vapor cloud is kind of feeding a black hole. It may contain enough gases, such as carbon monoxide, to help its black hole grow even six times bigger than it is now. We all know that Earth has one moon, but there are two more asteroids, 3753 Carinia and 2002 AA29, locked into co-orbital orbits with our planet. The first one doesn't really circle around the Earth, but has some sort of a synchronized orbit with the planet, which is why it looks like it's following the Earth in a stable orbit, while in reality, it has its own specific path around the Sun. The other one, 2002 AA29, follows a horseshoe orbit around our planet. Its specific path brings the asteroid closer to us every 95 years. You'd expect Neptune to be an extremely cold and dark place. After all, it's an ice giant 2.8 billion miles away from the Sun. There's not too much sunlight there. So noon on Neptune is similar to twilight on our planet. But this ice giant appears to be creating its own heat. To be precise, 2.6 times more heat than it gets from the Sun. This probably has to do with all the pressure near the planet's core. It builds and releases hydrogen, which keeps Neptune's center at a crazy temperature of 9300 degrees Fahrenheit but its atmosphere is still quite chilly. It ranges from about negative 240 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 330 degrees Fahrenheit. What shape do you think of when someone mentions storms? Probably long ovals of hurricanes and conical tornadoes, but that's something we see on Earth. At Saturn's North Pole, a storm has been raging for at least the past 40 years, and it has a hexagonal shape. 
Such a weird shape probably has something to do with Saturn's turbulent gas, or maybe even with zonal jets that extend many miles down into a region of extremely high pressure. Have you ever wondered why planets don't twinkle while stars do? The thing is, if you were out there in space, you wouldn't see them twinkling at all. The reason we see stars twinkling is because of Earth's atmosphere. The pin-sized light coming from a star hits the atmosphere. The atmosphere then refracts it, which sends the light skittering off in a zigzag. That's what we perceive as the twinkle. Planets appear much bigger to us than just pinpoints. And yes, their light zigs and zags after hitting the atmosphere too. But those motions cancel each other out, which is why we don't see twinkling, but only a steady glow. In some regions, you can expect big changes in temperature. For example, in Montana, where in a single day, temperatures went from negative 54 degrees Fahrenheit to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, sounds like a lot, but it's still nothing compared to Mercury, where temperatures tend to vary over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit in a single day. They start out at negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit at night and eventually go up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the daytime. Picture a wardrobe you'd need to prepare for a single 24-hour visit to Mercury. Why doesn't the atmosphere of our home planet vanish and disappear into the vacuum of space? Even though we can't see them, the gas and vapor molecules that our atmosphere consists of all have mass. As such, all of these molecules feel the gravitational pull of the Earth, just like we do. They could escape, true, if they had enough energy. For instance, if our planet was closer to the Sun, the atmosphere would be hotter and its molecules could get away easier. But the Earth, fortunately, is just at the right distance from the Sun and has exactly enough mass to keep its atmosphere in the same place. When you think of volcanoes, you probably picture hot molten lava coming out of them. At least, that's how it works on Earth. But in space, volcanoes can spew methane, water, or even ammonia. Up there, a volcano can also spew specific materials that freeze as they erupt. Then they turn into frozen vapor and some sort of volcanic snow. It's a common thing on Jupiter's moons Europa and Io, also on Pluto, and Saturn's moon Titan. They're called cryovolcanoes, and Io has extremely active ones. Over there, you'd see hundreds of vents with plumes of frozen vapor that tend to extend about 250 miles. And NASA vehicles have even captured some erupting in real time. Bam! Planets, moons, asteroids, comets, and stars, they can all collide. And galaxies, too. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 2.5 million light years away from Andromeda, our closest galactic neighbor. Astronomers believe the Milky Way is on a collision course that will destroy both galaxies in the distant future. Or at least, galaxies as we know them. The two galaxies are going faster and faster toward each other at a rapid clip, 250,000 miles per hour. It will be chaotic, and many planets and stars won't survive the collision. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.